Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Banco Santander's conference call to discuss our financial results for the first half of 2024. Just as a reminder, both the results report and presentation we will be following today are available to you on our website. I am joined here today by our CEO, Mr. Hector Grisi, and our CFO, Mr. Jose Garcia Cantera. Following their presentations, we will open the floor for all and any questions you may have in the Q&A session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 5 on your phone. And with this, I will hand over to Mr. Greasy. Hector, the floor is yours. Thank you, Begoña. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, today's presentation will follow the usual structure. First, I will talk about our H1 results in the context of our strategy. Uh, then Jose will uh, then review our financial performance in greater detail. And then I will conclude with some final messages. As Begunia said, uh, we will then open the floor for your questions. The main highlights of our results in the first half of 2024 are the following. Q2 was another record quarter for Santander, which shows the strength of our strategy and the resilience of our business model. Profit reached 3.2 billion, that's 20% above Q3, Q2 23, even after the impact of 450 million euros of one-time charges, net of taxes and minorities. Excluding them, recurring profit was 3.7 billion in Q2. Profit in the first half reached 6.1 billion euro, also a record high of 16%, supported by the strong custom revenue growth in all regions and global businesses. We continue to accelerate one transformation to become simpler, more automated, and more integrated. As a result, our efficiency ratio improved by 261 basis points to 41.6%, the best in 15 years. And our return on tangible equity rose 137 basis points to 15.9%, or 16.3 if we analyze the impact of the temporary levy in Spain. Finally, our solid balance sheet with a sound capital ratio, solid credit quality, and a strict capital discipline help us reach strong profitable growth and shareholder value creation with TNAF plus dividends per share increasing 12%. Let us stop for a moment in our income statement. As always, we present growth rates in both current and constant euros. This quarter, there were no material differences between them. Since last quarter, we have reported variation in constant euros in all countries except Argentina, which is shown in current euros to mitigate the distortions from hyperinflation. In Q2, we have taken a prudent approach again and used an inflation-adjusted exchange rate for the Argentine peso, given the significant divergence between inflation and the official effects. Although it has little impact when comparing half years, distortions are more significant when we compare with Q1. Charges. These were 210 additional Swiss <coughs> mortgage provision in Poland, reaching coverage of 100 percent. 240 million from the write down of our merchant platform in Germany and Super Digital in Latin America, that will, I will explain in more detail later on. Additionally, we have positive and negative one offs in impacts in Brazil which do not affect profit and have been netted in the underlying P&L. This, as you can see, is a strong first half of the year, with solid commercial and business dynamics that already puts us ahead of our plan for 2024. As a result, we have upgraded some of our targets for the year. We have increased our revenue growth target to high single digit, with better NII and fee income. We have improved our efficiency ratio 
initial target to around 42% as accelerating one transformation leads to higher operational leverage. And we have raised our ROTE target to above 16% versus the previous 16%. We are also confirming the rest of our targets for the year. Cost of risk is expected to remain stable at around 1.2% on active risk management and strong labor markets. As a reference, year-to-day cost of risk was 1.17%, even with additional provisions that I just described in Poland. In capital, our CT1 ratio ended June at 12.5%, with a strong organic capital generation in line with our target to be above 12%, even after the Basel III implementation. One transformation and the operational leverage it brings are behind our record performance, structurally improving both revenue and cost performances. Simplifying and automating processes, plus our active spread management, have already contributed 266 basis points of efficiencies since we started. Our global businesses continue to push a group's profitability and have delivered 87 basis points in efficiency gains. Finally, our proprietary and global tech capabilities have generated 71 basis points in efficiencies so far. As we have often said, we are going back to basics, which supports value creation based on profitable growth. How? By focusing on offering customers the best product and user experience, and by obtaining the operational leverage from our global platforms and common tech. This is reflected in the performance of our, our global businesses. Our retail and consumer businesses' efficiency ratio improved by 480 basis points and 270 basis points, respectively. In CIB, we are building a world-class business, leveraging our expertise to grow in the U.S maintaining a risk profile. Revenue grew 6%, another record, supported by the strong performance and client flows in the U.S. Wealth continued its strong growth, improving efficiency and profitability, and in payments, where we manage over 100 million cards in the group, we have significantly improved profitability. As a reminder, in Q1 of last year, we had a one-time fee from a commercial agreement in Brazil, excluding this impact, payments revenue would be 6% up and efficiency would have improved by 113 basis points, even after investing in the global platforms. In the coming five slides, I will review the advances on each of our global businesses. Let's start with retail where we are working to become the number one bank for our customers. It is a great example of the benefits from one transformation. Innovation helps to offer the best customer experience. In Mexico, for example, our new digital processes helped onboarding time and led to a record 90,000 digital account openings just last month. A common operating model across our banks, automation and digital Digitalization frees up time of our people to focus on commercial activities. The education of resources to non-commercial activities has dropped 8% versus last year. Deployment of our global platform has continued. In the U.S., it has been successfully completed. Within the group, Gravity is already operational in Spain, the U.K., Mexico, Brazil, and Chile, and it is processing a number of transactions that is around 20% higher year on year. Financially, we're extracting the potential from today's favorable conditions in our footprint as we benefit from our diversification. We carefully manage margins in the higher for longer rate environment in Europe and keep capturing the benefits from our negative sensitivity to rates in South America and what we achieve a strong 
capital, sorry, strong operational leverage across the group. As a result, our profit grew 35% year on year, Rote up 430 basis points to 18.1 on the back of revenue up double digit on good performance of NII and fees, with all regions growing, especially Europe and South America. Cost is well under control, down 4% in real terms, reflecting the structural benefits from our transformation and provision and cost of risk fairly stable at comfortable levels. In consumer, we strive to be the partner of choice for our customers. Our best-in-class global solutions are integrated into our partners' processes. For example, last year, we launched a new digital onboarding to pure direct auto players, which allows them to offer their customers the completion of their auto finance online end-to-end -end in very little time. We are progressing well in deposit gathering to increase NII stability and autonomous funding across the interest rate cycle. Deposits were up 14% year-on-year, supported by our digital, digital solutions. We expect positive trends to continue, helped by the launch of our deposit gathering platforms. Deploying global platforms is key to scaling our business, reducing cost to serve, and improving profitability. In checkout lending, we recently launched installment loans with Apple in Germany through Lucinia, which we are looking to expand to other European countries. Consumer had a great quarter on its operational leverage, which resulted in double-digit growth in net operating income and a 4% profit increase in H1, with number one, a strong revenue, driven by positive commercial dynamics with higher volumes, mainly in Europe and Brazil, good NII performance, and 27% fee growth from insurance. Number two, cost falling 3% in real terms on the execution of our strategy and efficiency plans executed last year. And third, higher provisions, mainly Swiss France mortgages, and expected cost of risk normalization in Europe and the U.S. Volumes and good profitability levels of the new to pay off with several firsts. For example, we made our first corporate share buyback for a U.S. company, and we were appointed global coordinator for a U.S. listed IPO for the first time ever. In Mexico, we are creating a significant partnership within the Mexico-U.S. corridor, leveraging our global markets and U.S. PAN built-out initiatives. And these are just a few examples from a long list. As a result, revenue in, the C in CIB in the U.S. rose 33% year-on-year. This strong growth reflects the benefits of our U.S. banking build-out initiative, which will become even more evident in the coming quarters. We continue to expand and strengthen our centers of expertise, including key industry groups such as chemicals, technology, and paper and packaging. Our CIB business is capital light, very much linked to customers, and with fees growing at a good pace year on year. Our active capital management continues to support great origination and high profitability levels. In essence, CIB has had great results, increasing revenue in H1 6% year on year, even after a record first half in 23, making H1 the best ever, with fees growing at double digits and the vast majority of our growth coming from customer flows. Moving on to wealth management and insurance, we continue to build the best bank, private bank and insurance manager in Europe and the Americas. How? Number one, by improving customer relationships through the best service and right solutions resulting in double-digit growth in private banking customers. Second, collaboration with other businesses, especially retail and CIB, which is a major driver for growth and allows us to capture network benefits. Collaboration fees increased by 12% year-on-year. Third, developing global platforms
platforms across all three businesses and digitalize our distribution and advisory capabilities to improve customer experience and promote growth. A good example of this is AutoCompara, our auto insurance comparison engine that operates in six countries and which we are expanding to new segments and businesses. In summary, we're accelerating growth and maintaining high profitability. Attributable profit rose double digit on strong private banking activity in a favorable interest rate environment with total fees from all three businesses growing at double digit and cost topped slightly in real terms. Finally, efficiency improved 230 basis points year on year and Rote rose to 300, 350 basis points to over 80%. Finally, payments, where we have a unique positions on both sides of the value chain. One issuing, where we manage more than 100 million cards group-wide, and second, in merchant acquiring. In merchant, we are the second largest acquirer in Latin America and a market leader in Spain and Portugal with the right balance between growth and profitability. We are gaining market share in most markets as we strengthen Net's customer <clears throat> value proposition with new global solution. An example is dynamic currency conversion in Mexico, which has helped GetNet to become second in Mexico with a 20% market share and a 47% EBDA margin in Q2. We continue to migrate significant volumes of payments to Pagonex global platform to leverage the group's scale. The transactions managed globally through Pagonex payments support passed 1 billion per year during the first half of this year with 50% growth quarter on quarter. The rollout of PLARD, our global cards platform, is on track. We continue to increase the number of debit cards managed in PLARD at a good pace and we're starting the migration of the debit portfolio. We plan to manage around 15 million cards through PLARD in Brazil by year end. As I mentioned earlier, we recorded one of charges in Pagonex from the write down of investments. One is a discontinuation of our merchant platform in Germany we announced in June, as we are focusing on our current acquiring value proposition in our core markets, where we have a very competitive business. The other one is our decision to write down SuperDigital, a natural step to promote the use of common platforms forms across the group and maximize operational leverage. These decisions will enable a more stable and profitable business, reducing fixed costs going forward. Excluding these impacts, underlying performance was very positive. Profit in payments was up 30% year on year on good revenue performance, cost falling in real terms while we invest in our common platforms and sound credit quality in cards. Pagonex EBDA margin improved to 20%, one of the best among competitors. We expect the consistent execution of our strategy, efficiency, and capex optimization will continue to drive profitability in the coming quarters. Today's results show that our strategy has enabled us to deliver outstanding profitability growth in H1. With double digit shareholders the value creation for the fifth consecutive quarter. Rote was 16.3%, up 134 basis points year on year, reflecting the high levels of profitability at which we are originally originating new business. EPS rose to nearly 37 cents, that's around 20% year on year, and we delivered 12% growth in shareholder value creation. Supported all by strong profit generation, a strict discipline in capital allocation, and share rivals. We have repurchased around 11% of our standing shares in the last three years, returning around $6.5 billion through buybacks and providing a return on investment of 19% to our shareholders. I'll leave you now with Jose to go into our financial performance in more detail. Please, Jose. Thank you, Hector. And good morning, everyone. Like always, I will go into a bit more momentum, both in Europe and in Latin America, at the same time.
in time. Revenue grew 9%, with the highest NII and fee income in our history, and costs were down slightly in real terms. As a result, operating income was up 14%. Provisions increased even after including the 200 million increase in Swiss franc provisions that we took in the quote. On the right-hand side, you can see the upward trend in profit quarter on, on quarter at 12%. Uh, which was driven by uh, top-line growth with uh, lower cost and provisions fairly flat, as I just mentioned. Let me now spend a couple of minutes on, on the reasons why we're starting to use a new, new inflation-adjusted exchange rate in Argentina, rather than the official one. We have observed a significant divergence between the official exchange rate and inflation, and we have decided to follow a prudent accounting approach. The new exchange rate is the result of adjusting the official exchange rate with the differential between the inflation in Argentina and in the U.S. This is a very conservative approach and a much more conservative way of recognizing the actual value in euros of our results and our investment in Argentina. And this should mitigate the volatility that uh, the currency might experience in the future, as you all remember, was the case in 2023. Following the ES accounting rules, we have recorded the full Q1 and Q2 impacts from this adjustment in Q2, uh, which does not significantly affect the year-on-year -year figures, but it has significant, a significant impact and, and causes some distortions when, look, when we look at quarter-on-quarter, quarter, and I will try to show this uh, differences in the coming slides. For instance, uh, NII uh, would have, uh, is dropping, is, is, is down 4% in the quarter, but if we uh, exclude Argentina, the group's NII would have gone up 2%. Something similar happens with fees. Instead of uh, decreasing uh, in the quarter, uh, increasing 1%, they would have increased 3%, and costs would have been fairly flat. If this uh, exchange rate does not uh, materialize, we would revert this adjustment and account for, for the results that we are not recognizing today. But it looks to us that this is a prudent, uh, more conservative way of recognizing our, our investment and results in Argentina. There was a strong total revenue growth driven by customer revenue again this quarter, which made up more than 95% of total revenue. This strong uh, growth was primarily supported by retail. Retail accounts, as you know, for more than 50% of our, our, of our uh, businesses and is growing at double digits with very good performance in NII across regions. Some fees also growing, especially in the Americas, and also consumer, which is reaching good profitability levels in in new businesses and a strong loan growth in Europe and Latin. Corporate investment banking also had a good quarter as, re as revenue reached an all-time high both in the quarter and in the first half of the year, particularly in Spain, in the U.S. and in Mexico. Also double-digit growth in wealth, as I mentioned, as a sector mentioned, driven by solid commercial activity in private banking and in asset management. Payments uh, also performing very well, uh, particularly we exclude the one-time positive impact recorded in Brazil in the first quarter of 23, as you remember, which we explained, and Hector just mentioned, where we had a one-off from a, an agreement with MasterCard. And finally, the corporate center's higher liquidity buffer remuneration was offset by higher TILA chemtrail issuances and the negative impact from FX hedging. Most of our revenue growth came from NII, which continued to increase uh, in the quarter if we exclude Argentina, particularly driven by retail, consumer, and CIB, which represented 95% of groups in AI. In the, on the slide, you can see that we are, in this small box in red, uh, putting the figure that we, we would have recorded if we had used the official Argentina uh, exchange rate. So this is important. Keep this in mind and to show again that, you know, what we have decided to to do is a prudent accounting uh, of our uh, profits coming from Argentina. NII rose 11% year on year, supported by all businesses and regions, on the back of very active uh, 
price management in retail Europe, especially in the post-sheets, also higher volumes um, and, and the benefits of negative sensitivity to interest rates in South America, in consumer South America, in retail South America, in consumer, sorry, which is now very evident uh, in Brazil, especially in Brazil and Chile, and very, very good levels of activity in corporate investment banking. In terms of profitability, we have improved a net interest margin uh, year on year, uh, explained by higher yield on assets as we continue repricing our, our books, but also, uh, you know, very good management of deposit costs, um, which more than that, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, outweighed uh, um, the pressures that we are uh, seeing. It's, it's, it's uh, true that the margin is expanding, as you can see, if we exclude Argentina or if we had used the um, uh, official exchange rate. So overall, the margin management, pricing management on both the asset side and liability side is really strong. We, are, we see a slight deterioration, though, uh, if we use our official exchange rate or our, our adjusted exchange rate, although it's not very significant in the quarter. Going forward, we, we would expect uh, some marginal margin pressure in Europe that will be more than compensated by positive contribution from the Americas and our consumer business. In the context of uh, low fee growth in general across the sector as a result of uh, subdued loan demand, we generated another record uh, quarter in, in fee income at 6.5 billion euros with solid uh, growth all across the five businesses. Retail increased 3%, basically driven by Brazil, North America, and Poland. Outstanding performance in consumer uh, on the back of very strong insurance businesses. Corporate investment banking also grew from already the very high levels in the first quarter, in the first half of last year, especially in the U.S. Wealth uh, supported by very strong private banking activity and payments uh, that, as, as we mentioned, was affected by the one-time uh, fee record, recorded in Brazil last year. Structural efficiency gains are from our transformation program are very evident. Quarter after quarter, cost income was 41.6%, the best level that we have reported for the last 15 years, and one of the best in the sector, is already better than the levels that, that we guided for 2024. Cost declined quarter on quarter, were very flattish if we exclude Argentina, after, after having been stable for the last three quarters, with revenue growing steadily quarter after quarter. Uh, in, improving and increasing operational leverage that we obviously expect to continue to have in the second half of the year and into 2025. Average inflation continued its gradual decline down from 12% a year ago to below 4% this quarter. In this context, cost fell 1% in real terms year on year, despite that, as you all know, we have some lagged effects from, from higher inflation on salaries and other costs. And our investments in transformation. By businesses, costs remain well under control in retail, consumer, and payments, which, represented, which represent 80% of our cost base. And 80% of the increase, as you can see on the bottom of the chart, came from CIB, re reflecting our strategy to reinforce our corporate investment banking franchise. In fact, if we exclude this investment, costs in the rest of the group would have decreased 3% in real terms. Credit quality remained very much under control, uh, obviously supported by a stable economic environment and our active risk management all across the group. Cost of risk was 1.21%. Remember that we look at the last 12 months. If we look at the first, uh, this quarter we generated 52 basis points points organically, supported by our asset rotation initiatives to compensate organic risk-weighted asset growth. We recorded 25 basis points charge for shareholder remuneration in line with our 50% payout. And finally, there was a seven, uh, seven basis point negative impact 
impact, mainly related to intangibles, the valuation of available for sale portfolios and others. There were not significant regulatory impacts in the quote. We continue to deploy capital to the most profitable growth opportunities and expand our asset mobilization capabilities to maximize capital productivity. Our disciplined capital allocation has resulted in a new book return on risk-weighted assets of 2.9% in the quarter, which is equivalent to a return on tangible equity of 23%, well above that of our back book at 16%. Our centralized asset management desk, which aims at optimizing capital deployment, is achieving outstanding results. In the first half, we disposed of an amount of capital capital equivalent of 30 billion in risk-weighted assets at a cost of capital of half of that of the new originations. In addition, the one-third of our balance sheet that matures every year is being substituted by the more profitable new businesses at this return on tangible equity of 23%. The combination of these actions explain the expanding profitability and the increase in capital ratio. Let me turn it now back to Hector for his conclusions. Thank you, Jose. As our results clearly show, we continue to make a good progress towards the targets we set for 2025 in our last investor day, thanks to our unique business model and the execution of our strategy. With the strong and increasing organic capital generation and execution of our capital allocation plans, further improving our profitability to above 16%. And by growing both profit and profitability sustainably, we have been able to deliver 12% value creation to our shareholders. We said it in, an, in our investor day, and I want to remind you again, we have entered a new phase of value creation for our shareholders. In conclusion, the benefits from the execution of our strategy are very evident. A strong growth in revenue with flattish cost and around 20% growth in EPS. And the best ever H1 profit with all-time high NII, fees, and net operating income backed by strong performance in all our businesses and regions. Sustained pro progress in our structural change to a simpler and more integrated model, leveraging the group's scale, is driving both high revenue and lower cost to achieve the best efficiency ratio we have ever reported in the last 15 years. A rock-solid balance sheet and robust credit quality are contributing to growth and double-digit shareholder value creation. As a result, we expect to exceed some of our targets for 24. We are upgrading our revenue growth target to high single digits. Efficiency to around 42%. And as we deploy capital to the most profitable growth opportunities, we are improving our profitability target to above 16%. Our focus at Santander is to be reliable in providing returns that compound on an always increasing quantum of tangible book value consistently and through the cycle based Star 5 on your telephone. We already have our first question from Sophie Peterson from JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, this is Sophie from JP Morgan. Thanks a lot for taking my question. So my first question would be on the um, uh, risk transfer. Did I hear correctly that you saw 30 billion of risk credit asset disposal in the quarter uh, and maybe you could uh, just uh, talk about the, the decline in risk credit assets I see risk credit assets especially in Spain were down around 2% quarter and quarter in digital consumer bank minus 1% quarter and quarter but in both entities um, the loan book grew by 3% quarter and quarter um, so so how should we think about these uh, SRTs or securitization and, and what will be the revenue impact going forward from, 
income security, I think, some of the, the loans. And also related to that, if you could just remind us on the, uh, the regulatory capital headwinds uh, coming uh, in the second half. And then my second question would be on eBury. Um, there has been quite a few press uh, articles suggesting that you're looking to potentially IPO eBury. Could you just remind us what the tangible book value for a share uh, is for the, or tangible book value for these businesses? How much revenue do you get from eBury? And what your kind of plans for eBury is? Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. I mean, uh, first of all, I mean, uh, our policy basically has been uh, to, as, as Jose was explaining in detail, to rotate the balance sheet as much as we can. This is basically a very important change uh, for us, given the um, high um, capabilities that we have to regenerate assets. Okay, so this is basically helping us to rotate, and also uh, giving us a, a new, basically, I would say, a turbocharger in the sense that with um, every single time that we sell something, we basically reuse that capital or redeploy the capital within the organization at a much better price. So that's exactly what we're doing and rotating the capital in a much better way. As Jose was explaining to you, uh, we rotate a third of the balance sheet every year. And, and since we're very focused on profitability, we're actually reinvesting better and better. And that's actually a new way of basically managing the balance sheet of the bank. Uh, uh, then Jose can give you a little bit of the details in terms of what you were explaining about it. In terms of regulatory capital, as we told you, uh, our guidance is basically to be above 12% uh, after regulatory um, charges, etc. So uh, we continue to basically uh, hang on to that, uh, to, to that um, number, 12%, above 12% will be, and, and, as we, and as I said, and Jose basically reiterated, we're going to be above the 12% um, after Basel three as well. And in terms of uh, the IPO of Ivory, we'll give you the details. Um, Jose will give you the details on that. Thank you, Jose. Uh, hi, hi, Sophie. Uh, the first, first of all, the 30 billion was resuited assets in the first half. So uh, more or less 40% uh, of this is SRTs, but the rest is other types of uh, transactions like asset sales, hedges, uh, etc. Uh, the cost of mobilizing this 30 billion was around in rote equivalent. Okay, we, all, we always look at ROWA, but just to, to use the same currency everywhere, in rote equivalent, the cost of mobilizing this 30 billion was slightly below 10%. And we reinvested the capital, as I said, at 23%. So there was at least 13 percentage points difference on this 30 billion in risk. Assets. 30 billion in risk weighted assets is close to 4 uh, billion in capital times, you know, this 13%. So on an annualized basis, we generated increased profits with the same capital of around 500 million. We expect to continue doing this. The, the demand for private credit is, is significant. Uh, the, we have a very busy second half of the year. It's difficult to, to replicate the same figure in the second half of the year because of holidays, etc. But we expect to mobilize much more, more than last year. And as you can see from the figures I gave you, this is very profitable. Capital headwinds this year, we still expect 20 to 30 basis points in the, in the second half of the year. Uh, Basel III, uh, as, as Hector mentioned, fully loaded. And when we mention fully loaded, is fully loaded that even taking into account those impacts that come in 2029, uh, uh, we will be comfortably above 12%, and the day one impacts will be very relatively small, as we mentioned before. And in the case of Avery, we are always looking at ways of, ma of managing the capital and maximizing capital usage. So there was some news that we, we are contemplating an IPO in Uh, again, we are looking at all types of alternatives to maximize the capital. This is one of them. That doesn't necessarily mean that this will be executed. And again, this 
will be put as one of our uh, several capital management initiatives that we have across the group. Thank you. Can we have the next question, please? Next question from Ignacio Ulargi from BNP Paribas. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. I have two questions. Um, the first one is on uh, the revenue performance. We have seen a very good performance in Europe, probably a bit better than what we expected, at, at least I expected at the beginning of the year. Um, uh, LATAM has been lagging a bit behind with, us, with Brazil being softer. How should we think about the revenue performance going forward in the second half um, when you have upgraded the revenue guidance to, to high single digit from the 9% currently? Um, so we expect second half um, in line with these levels, kind of getting a bit of a sense whether LATAM should have set the weakness of Europe that you businesses. As you know, we're very focused on profitability in the way we're structuring things and not basically spaying off. All right. Uh, I believe that, I mean, revenue will continue basically uh, to give good results. Um, I don't see that LATAM has a weakness. I see that uh, actually LATAM is going to be doing very well in the second half. And you can see also very good results coming out of what they're doing in retail in Brazil. Okay, and also Chile is doing the, quite a good um, performance. Mexico, basically uh, on retail, we're changing the mix, and that's why you see the flat uh, revenue, the, the flat NII on there. But I mean, it will continue to give uh, very good results. So we expect a very good second half um, of the year in, in terms of revenue, and uh, and in that sense, on, on basically what you were asking about the UK. UK whispered a better second half. First of all, we see that the market is uh, a little bit more rational. Competition has been uh, uh, much rational than we, you know, than we saw during the first uh, quarter. Second quarter has stabilized. We also, uh, some of the strategies we have done in terms of betas are paying off. Okay. So I believe that uh, all in all, UK will, much, uh, will have a much better second half of the year. Uh, than we have seen. Uh, in terms of detail, in basically is um, more rational behavior, as I told you. Uh, fees are not going to be doing that well due to the due to the switcher campaign that we structured, and uh, but benefits will come over in the third and fourth quarter much better than the, the way we basically saw it. And what you're going to see is also a very good cost control because we have. Cost control initiatives coming into the UK, which uh, are going to make, make the business perform much better uh, than we saw. I don't know, Jose, we'd like to complement a little bit on, on the yeah. revenue side, but. I think I'm sure that you will ask about, uh, and uh, yeah, you mentioned that revenue in Europe is better than you expected. Um, at the beginning of the year, we guided for a drop in NII in the Eurozone. We now see NII in the Eurozone, particularly in Spain, Portugal. Portugal, et cetera, up mid-single digits. Obviously, rates are higher for longer. Um, so, so much better performance in NII. We have uh, hedged a substantial uh, amount of our um, balance sheets in the Eurozone, basically through the ALCO portfolio, hedging the uh, assets, particularly mortgages, and also swapping our uh, fixed uh, liabilities into variable liabilities, and it means that the sensitivity of our NII in Europe going forward is going to be significantly lower uh, than we had before. So, as Hector mentioned, we expect fairly stable, maybe slightly down NII in Spain in the second half of the year and next year, but at the same time, we continue to see good momentum coming from, from South America, Brazil, and particularly Chile. So, we are constructive on the future evolution of, uh, of NII and revenue in the second half. Thank you. Can we have the next question, please? Next question from Alvaro Serrano from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. 
Hi, good morning. Uh, uh, can I ask a couple of, of, of follow-ups? Um, on, on Just on the question and the comment you've just made around mid single digit in, in Spain and AI, that implies uh, I think almost nine percent reduction, half on half, which is 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 feels a bit substantial. So I don't know if you if 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 I've done my math very quickly wrong, or or if if you can sort of add a bit of color on that. And then um, um, on on the performance and fees in the U.S., could you give us a bit of color on the obviously very strong performance, but um, if you can uh, maybe sort of give us some kind of color on split on, is it ECM, DCM, just to uh, form an opinion of, of how sustainable it is going forward. If I can slip in a, a third, um, you've mentioned the over 12% capital, but I thought it, the target was 12.5% at the end of the year. So it, can you just confirm that's the case and, and, and we should still expect the 20, 30 basis points, uh, regulatory headwinds. Thank you. Thank you, Alvaro. First of all, let me talk about capital. In capital, we have always said we're going to be above 12%, okay? And that basically has been the guidance we're at 12 and a half right now, and we said, as uh, Jose basically um, <clears throat> reiterated, that we're going to be above 12% even after Basel 3 fully loaded, okay? That's exactly the guidance. In terms of performance, performance in the U.S. fees, okay, the majority is basically the CIB uh, business. The CIB is the one that is driving, and also a little bit um, in ter terms of uh, good performance in retail uh, that we're having a little bit also in the U.S., but uh, CIB is the main driver, okay? It's been growing, uh, it, grow, it grew 38% year on year, 1.3% quarter on quarter. As you know, CIB business uh, is... Um, Cyclical, so we have pretty good mandates. The business is basically doing well, and also a very good connection in between uh, what we're doing with the U.S., as I explained during the presentation, with the business in Latin America and the business in Europe. What's happening, and let me explain a little bit, is some of the businesses that we used to do in terms of uh, DCM that we wouldn't get because we wouldn't be seen as a dollar house, we are becoming one, and you see us top three in the, um, in, the, in the league tables right now in Latin America, doing dollar transactions, not just to the corporates, but also to the governments. I mean, uh, when UMS did their transaction at the beginning of the year, $7.5 billion, we were one of the principal book runners in the transaction. So um, you're starting to see that because of the, of the BFOP that we did in the U.S., so that's starting to pay off. I believe that uh, with the four teams that we added, I think we're going to complement the rest of the business and we continue driving fees up. But let's see what happens with the cyclicality of the business. On the other side, retail is also performing well in fees, and we believe that it continues to do so uh, over the rest of the year. In terms of um, what we gave to uh, in terms of Spain, Okay, quarter performance, loans are starting to reprice lower at uh, lower rates, but deposits betas are behaving very well. This is helping contain the cost of deposits. Also, as Jose explained you in detail, um, alcohol volumes are helping, and the lower cost of the hedging, which uh, were not in place before, are now are in place, so it's gonna, that's going to help us. NII, as Jose said, is reaching its peak, but I expect um, NII to grow mid-single did it in 24, better performance than we expected at the beginning of the year. And it's also because of the higher for longer rates environment that we're experiencing. Okay. Uh, I don't know if Fossi would like to add yeah, something. So, so, yeah. Of last year, and we expect to be able to keep that same level in 2025. In terms of capital, 20 to 30 basis points headwinds taking into account that we generate 20 to 30 basis points BAU, you should expect our capital ratio to be basically at these levels by year end. The guidance of 12% is post Basel III fully loaded. Thank you. Can we have the next question, please? 
Next question from Marta Sanchez Romero from City. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a couple of follow-ups on the U.S. So you're still struggling to deliver positive jobs. Uh, when do you think things will turn around there? Uh, do you think that we we will see positive jobs uh, in the second half of the year? Uh, in the U.S. as well, your PNL still remains pretty supported by tax credits. Can you help us understand how the tax line will look like in the next few quarters? Uh, and then, um, if I may, well. If I may ask, um, do, do you think the new reporting is, is helping investors understand Santander better? Because judging by your low PE, I think uh, I think not. So I would like to hear your thoughts there. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Okay, let me explain you a little bit what's going on in the U.S. If you look at by business, you're going to see that retail is actually having lower cost than it used to have because of the transformation, even with the uh, uh, strong investment we're doing in transformation. But we have done a really cost, good cost reduction, and uh, we believe we're going to perform better. The yields are negative due to the fact that we're investing in CIB, and CIB, as you understand, I mean, costs a lot to do it. So if we're going to have uh, a second half that is better, it's going to start looking better, but uh, it's going to depend on the cyclicality of the CIB business and some of the still people that are coming into the team that will start to come in in the next few months. As you know, uh, there is a period of um, garden leave, etc. But the main reason is the investment we're doing in CIB, which by in any way is not creating a big investment bank or anything like that. This is basically, as we said, complementing the rest of the business that we have, our size is not going to be huge. It's the size of a really small boutique, but it's helping us out to beef up and to help us in, in, the, remainder of, uh, in the remainder of the business. And you can see fees are starting to basically be up due to that fact. Okay? In terms of the p &L, it's quite easy to understand. The DTAs are basically what we said last year that we, when we started doing uh, the electricity electric vehicles. I mean, uh, we signed uh, contracts with some OEMs that are generating these ZTAs, and that's why you see that the PNL is affected by that, and it's going to continue due to the fact that uh, we'll continue to be absorbing, I mean, that volume. So we have now, now three things, is, and, and this is basically leases on electric vehicles that are creating the DTAs in the U.S., all right? And uh, you're going to see that throughout uh, the year. In terms of the new reporting, it's, it's very important to understand what we're doing. The new reporting is helping us a lot in the way we are get managing the business on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? Because it's making us work together. It's making us spend a lot less. In the past, for example, and let me give you a really stupid example. I mean, we used to have 10, 11 different apps in our 10 different banks. And right now, we're just having one app being deployed in all the countries. For example, one app is being deployed. Today is being deployed in all of Europe. The last deployment we did was the UK. And they were deployed in Brazil. And, uh, and then we will, uh, were deploying also the US. So what happens is basically you use the same around 80, 20. And that's the goal that we're basically going through investing just once, and those 80% common, 20% common, 20% uh, customization per, per each country. So that basically will enable us in the future through these global platforms to work much, much better in a much cheaper way. We gave you a pretty good example in what, what we're doing in acquiring. When acquiring. When the acquiring platform was deployed in Mexico, it took us in 18 months to number two, and you saw the results that I explained. I mean, um, how EBDA is growing, and uh, I showed you in the presentation that uh, it's helping us quite a lot in terms of uh, positioning ourselves to be very competitive and with really high margins in every single market. And it's just one platform, the one that is being deployed. Now this platform is being deployed down to Chile, 
is being deployed to, to Argentina, and they will, we will deploy it in Europe in the, in the near future. So this is basically helping us to work together and to manage the business in a much better way. Then, in terms of how do you see the businesses and the way they're reporting, I mean, you're going to start getting used to it because it's going to be a lot easier for you to understand every single business in the way we're managing it. It. We're reporting now, as you can see, the operational leverage that we're getting by working together, in which revenue is going up, cost is staying stable, and is giving us a really profitable run. So it's very important that you understand that. Also, let, let, me, let me give you a great example. In CIB, where we are been working together for a long time, the same FX factories that we use for Mexico, Brazil, Spain or the UK are completely the same, and it's the same product, and we just made them once. So that basically tells you how we're going to be able, I mean, how we have been able to make it a really profitable business with growing revenue every single year, and with profitability at, at around 19% that I gave you. So this is exactly the points that we're doing, and I believe that this will enable us to give a lot more value to our shareholders. There is no way... We're going to give you more value if we don't work together and do things in a much cheaper way. Thank you. Can we have the next question, please? Next question from Francisco Riquel from Alantra. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. So two questions for me. The first one is on NII in Brazil. You still maintain the guidance of growth in the high things for the year. Uh, mid things would imply a quarter on quarter fall during the second half, if you think this could be the case um, or not. I mean, because uh, selling rates uh, have been, uh, expectations of, of cuts uh, have been pushed out. So you can comment on the main N uh, drivers of the NII in the coming quarters and also update on the <clears throat> sensitivity of the NII to um, selling rates in Brazil. <clears throat> and the second question uh, is about NII in the U.S. Uh, we have seen it's bottoming out in this uh, uh, second quarter, but I have also seen... Francisco, let me start with Brazil. First of all, as you have seen, I mean, uh, very strong and solid uh, numbers coming from Brazil. NII, once again, very strong quarter, up uh, more than 3% and it's up more than 22% in the year, okay? What's behind the performance is the combination of the healthy volume growth, the change in mix, and lower rates, okay? Uh, it is true. First of all, rates outlook has changed. The market is expecting a smaller than initially anticipated rate cut by the year, by year end, and uh, this ultimately means that NII growth will be a bit less intense than what we thought at the beginning of the year. That's a fact, okay? Uh, having said that, uh, we still expect Brazil NII to grow in the mid-teens mark by the end of 24. Okay, it's a good performance that should continue in 25. And uh, let me tell you that, uh, to take the opportunity, that Brazil has delivered a 16% rotate. We believe that uh, the end of the year should end up between 16 and 17, a strong profitability improvement is not just relying on NII growth, but on the good delivery on fees also, the cost contention that we have had, and expected uh, cost of risk stable during the year. So I'm, I remain very optimistic in Brazil and the ability to continue expanding the profitability, as, you, as uh, you have seen. In terms of open bank in the U.S., open bank will come into the U.S. with a deposit gathering facility towards September, October. Okay, we expect... Uh, that to come. The first phase is the post gathering, and uh, I believe it would be quite successful. We had a pretty good plan in place, and, uh, and then we'll come and we'll be improving uh, the platform as we see fit. In terms of deposits, the deposits, um, the transactional deposits that SBNA has had, had remained stable during the year. What, is, uh, what you have seen the movement uh, in deposits in the U.S. is basically uh, the deposits that we have in CIB, which are the ones that we decide on profitability, what's better for us or not. So sometimes, because of profitability, 
we, we, we basically let them go, and we, we, uh, and we move up, we see fit. So there is no problem into that, and we will continue to see uh, that working profitability towards uh, every business that we do. One quick comment on, on DCB Europe margins and profitability. Uh, the new business we wrote in 2021 was extremely profitable. This was post-COVID, and we had historically high profitability levels. This year is going to stay, this production is going to stay in our books for three years. So it's still in our books in 2024. It will gradually disappear between 24 and 25. The new business that we are writing in 2024 is at rotis of around 20%, road wash of 2.3, 2.4%, which is much, much higher than 22 and 23 annual productions. So, so you should expect in 2025 a very substantial pickup in profitability in margins and in profitability in consumer Europe because of this in and out of the different productions and the fact that there was an abnormally high uh, profitability in the year following COVID. Thank you. Can we have the next question, please? This question from Álvaro Fernández Garaizabal from UBS. Please go ahead. Yeah, hello, good morning, and thanks for taking my questions. I have two. First, uh, we assume you're aiming for the upper end of your ROT target for next year, so that is 17%, which implies a meaningful profit increase in 25 versus 24. So my question is, geographically, where is that earnings growth uh, going to come from? And second, uh, related to previous questions, uh, we have seen revenues improving in the U.S. over the last couple of quarters with volumes up, uh, customer spread expanding, and fees coming in quite strong. So basically, how sustainable is this uh, revenue pickup uh, going forward? Uh, thanks. OK. Thank you, Alvaro. Let me start with the U.S. Uh, to tell you, I believe, I mean, the U.S. revenue is going to continue to do pretty well. Uh, but, but the profitability is always the most difficult in the second part because of seasonality in terms of uh, what happens to us in provisions. So what you're going to see is um, revenue continue to go up, quite fairly strong. Let's see how we do in fees, as I said, due to the cyclicality of the CIB business. But revenues will be doing fine. In terms of uh, the seasonality, let's see how we do in terms of the provisions, but we believe and the indications that we have had in terms of provisions show us that uh, they're coming better. The LTM numbers that we have in provisions for the U.S. are much better than last year. Uh, so it look, it's, um, it's looking well. And so the U.S. shall have a, a much better year than last year. In terms of the Reti and 17, Jose, if you'd like to comment. Yeah, I mean, obviously uh, we expect profitability to continue to increase on the back of increase of Sorry, I, what I was saying is that uh, we expect our profitability to continue to increase on the back of a higher um, operational leverage. Our transformation program is delivering very positive jobs that we expect to um, maintain, particularly in consumer in, uh, and retail in 2025. Um, the negative the, the sensitivity to rates in Europe has been much decreased, as I mentioned before, and we should have positive tailwinds coming from NII in South America, both Brazil and, and Chile. Uh, so definitely uh, operational leverage is what, we, what will continue driving increased profitability. In terms of cost of risk, no signs of deterioration and you know, looking into the next few quarters, we see no signs that we will require 
required to increase our provisions going forward. So with, if you put all of this together, again, this means that our profits uh, uh, should continue to increase going forward. Thank you. Can we have the next question, please? Next question from Benjamin Toms from RBC. Please go ahead. Good morning. Thank you both for taking my questions. Uh, the first one's on Brazil. You used a 350 million gain to top up your provisioning. I think that's the strategy you've adopted before, but how comfortable are you that you will need, not need to do further top ups in Brazilian cost of risk going forward? And are the top ups a catch up, or can we assume that the top ups will mean a structurally lower cost of risk in Brazil in the coming years? And then, secondly, in the UK, in the deck, you mentioned that 100% of your hedge income is already locked in for 2024. This suggests that either you do not have any maturities this year or you pre-hedged some of your maturities. If you have been pre-hedging, what proportion of 2025 structural hedge maturities have you pre-hedged and what rate did you lock in at, given that swap rates have been volatile? And do you expect that the tailwind from the structural hedge will overwhelm the headwinds on NII in the UK in 2025. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me let me go to Brazil. Okay, first of all, it's very important to tell you that um, uh, increase uh, in provision is exclusively linked to the long growth that we have in the country. Okay. Cost of risk, as you have seen, is flat quarter on quarter, 4.77, and credit quality in Brazil remains uh, sound and solid. It's very important to understand that uh, the recent vintages that we have are performing very well and no signs of deterioration. Also, it's very important to understand that we're very focused on profitability and we have been very opportunistic, and we used the proceeds of a corporate transaction to further, further reinforce the balance sheet at this point, and we reiterate that the 24 guidance of delivering is a flattish cost of risk versus 23, okay, excluding the one-offs. So that's what I see in terms of Brazil. In terms of the UK, yeah, Jose, so, please. Yeah, so. so as you know, obviously the strategy is to keep the structural hedge position in line with uh, core deposits to protect the balance sheet ahead of decreasing interest rates. Following the recent increase in market rates, and in order to protect the NII, we have accelerated the plan investments for 2024, among, amongst other measures. So the sensitivity we have today is to a 100% decrease, in parallel decrease in, uh, in rates in, in the UK. Uh, today, is uh, minus 120 million pounds compared to minus 220 million pounds a year ago. So roughly we have half of the sensitivity today that we had a year ago. The current hedge, hedge uh, its uh, structural hedge is 114 billion pounds compared with 106 billion in December. So this is related to my comment before. Uh, with the duration of 2.5 years in December it was two sorry 2.5 years in December it was 2.4 years and the yield is a slightly over two percent thank you can we have the next question please next question from Carlos Pesotto from Caixaban PPI please go ahead yes hi good morning um, so, uh, sorry, my first question would actually be a, a, a follow-up uh, in, in Spain, and sorry to, to, to insist on, the, on, on this again, but uh, did I understood correctly, uh, and the message was that uh, uh, in, in 2025, uh, NII should be roughly aligned with the second half of this year, uh, where you, you already expect NII to, 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 to drop somewhat. Um, towards the, 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 the mid single digit growth in the full year that you that, that you are mentioning, uh, and then my second question would actually be on the um, on the US uh, EVs uh, tax rebate that you have been booking. I'm just wondering if you could give us some color on uh, on how the rebate works in the sense that, uh, or basically for how long is 
is it uh, is it uh, in in place? Uh, is it something that we should also witness next year? Uh, and also, it, is it uh, this uh, federal level uh, rebate or something at the state level? Um, in a, up to what extent the potential changes in in in, in, politi in po political changes in the U.S. Could could, could uh, drive that to, to disappear or not, just to have an idea on the, on the time frame for which this is valid right now. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. All right. I mean, uh, I think in the, uh, Jose gave a pretty, pretty good explanation of what's going on in terms of uh, how do we see no? uh, things. It's important to understand what Jose explained to you about uh, what we're doing on the hedges, the alcohol position that we have, that will help us uh, throughout the year, even if the rates come down. I think we're probably in the best ever position in that sense. Um, and uh, even as we say, I mean, the NII will slightly come down uh, over, the, over the second half, and then we'll see that we will have a pretty good run towards, uh, and let's see how rates basically behave. But I don't know, Jose, if you'd like to no, complement, but it's basically... It's exactly Exactly what I said, Carlos, is exactly what you said. Uh, we expect NII to go down slightly in the second half of the year. Uh, the year-on-year -year growth, 24 against 23, will be somewhere between 5 to 7 percent. And then next year, NII should be fairly flat uh, relative to the second half of this year, which means that NII should be down slightly, low single digits. Okay. Because again, we, and this is using the forward rate, uh, rate curves today. So if this was to change, obviously we would need to update these, uh, these estimates. But using forward uh, curve rates today, that's our best estimate for NII in Spain next year. And as sector mentioned, this is thanks to the substantial reduction in NII sensitivity that we have conducted in the Eurozone in the last year, year and a half. Thank you, Carlos. Okay, on your, in the U.S., let me walk you through exactly what happens. Okay, first of all, let me tell you that it's federal, okay? Uh, we don't know if uh, this is going to be sustained, if there is a change of government in the U.S. or not. Uh, you, you, I mean, uh, I don't want to speculate on that one. Exactly what happens is every single time we do a lease on an electric vehicle, we buy the vehicle in the bank, okay? So what you see is basically a situation in which we own the vehicle. And then we get the cash back or the, or the, sorry, the tax credit and you show the cash credit in one lump, okay, during the month in which we do that, all right, to be, to be exactly um, how it goes. So you don't see the impact in the revenue, but the impact you see it in the taxes. So that's exactly how it works. Uh, I don't know if I'm being correct or, or of, um, I mean, if I'm being uh, clear in one, the way I'm explaining to you this, but it's exactly how it works, all right? So what we have done is that we have a pro program, what we have signed with the OEMs that we're do doing this for, depends on the, also the capacity that we have to absorb those ETAs, because this is not, I mean, uh, un unlimited. This is not, I mean, we have to have, depends on the balance sheet that we have, and we have calculated the number exactly that we can absorb, and this is exactly what we negotiate with the OEMs. Um, I know if you understood uh, the question in the, in the right way, but uh, yep. this is exactly how it works. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we don't know if uh, it's going to happen in, in the future or not. Hopefully, it continues to be like that. Thank you. Can we have the next question, please? Next question from Miruna Kirea from Jeffries. Please go ahead. Morning, Hector. Morning, Jose. Thank you for taking my questions. I just have a couple of follow-ups, please, on points we touched on before. Firstly, in the UK, your NIA was slightly up quarter quarter in Q2. So just wondering how you see this progressing from here. And is it fair to say that Q1 was probably the low point on NIA? And it should start building from here, supported by the hedge. And what is the shape of of this into H2 and also into next year. Um, secondly, just a clarification on your U.S. business. You were talking about some seasonality into the second half of the year in provisions. Could you please explain what is driving this seasonality? 
And then lastly for Brazil, um, also taking into consideration your comments about changing the mix of your business, when do you expect to see a full normalization in cost of risk and around what level would this normalization be? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So as I said in the UK, we see that uh, we're going to have a second half better than the first half. Okay. Market is more, more rational, both, both in the east, in the in the margins and uh, in the betas. And on top of that, um, cost, as I said, is going to be slightly better uh, than the first half of the year. Q2 in uh, NII is showing signs of improvement. Okay. Uh, and as I basically explained, and we see that uh, betas are not going to go up, so that basically will help us. Uh, in terms of revenue, we see mid uh, to single digit decrease in NII down mid single digits versus last year, and, and uh, fees down low uh, double digit due to the fact that I was explaining about uh, what. Uh, we're doing with the switcher campaign and the higher cashback. You're going to see that it's going to be much better in, the, in 25 because exactly what we're preparing the bank towards that. Also, we're very focused on profitability. It's very important that you understand that, okay? We're not using capital below our cost of equity. So we're being very uh, tough on that, and that's exactly why we manage that. And then, Jose, I would like to... So yeah, so, sorry, one quick, quick comment. The, the mortgage dynamics in the UK uh, seem to suggest that margins in this business will pick up substantially from the fourth quarter of this year into next year, mm -hmm. just, just as, a, um, as, a, um, as an additional comment. Uh, Brazil cost of risk, we uh, still believe the cost of risk this year should be somehow below cost of risk last year. Remember that when you look at cost of risk quarter on quarter, it was a substantial increase in the fourth quarter when, when we uh, look at year on year X, the fourth quarter, and we look at cost of risk for the full of 2024, we would ex expect to see uh, an improvement in the cost of risk. So year on year, because the fourth quarter will come out in the fourth quarter of this year, you should see the most significant improvement in cost of risk in the fourth quarter. And then provisions in the U.S. are normalizing cost of risk this year should be somehow around 2% or slightly below 2%. Thank you. Can we have the last question, please? Last question from Alberto Negro from Medio Banca. Please go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks for taking my questions. I have just a few uh, follow-up. So the first one is on the UK. If you can give us more color on the contribution of the UK structural edge in the second half of this year and in next year. And the second one is, again, on, on Brazil, following your comment on the change of the loan mix. Should we expect a normalization of the cost of risk in the next year and see an absolute decline? No total provision next year. Thank you. Okay. In terms of Brazil, uh, we're changing the loan mix, but uh, we are very flexible and very dynamic in the way we change the loan mix over there, depending on what we are seeing and uh, how the vintages are behaving. Okay. So if we see that Brazil basically, and, and we're starting to see positive signs of how the mass market basically reacts, is inflation is coming down, and we see the rate coming down, we might change the mix again and we might be a little bit more aggressive. And uh, I couldn't tell you up at this point what are we going to do because we revise the strategy every single month of what we do and also the pricing. Drop significantly next year and that should help. In addition to the, the structure of the balance sheet, lower rates next year in Brazil will help not only in terms of NII but also cost of risk. It will be a gradual improvement. Uh, we, we need to see exactly, you know, how we will build the uh, business in 2025 in Brazil, but definitely lower rates should help. Thank you, Jose. Thank you, Hector. And thank you all for your attendance. Um, and if there are any further questions, send in that investor relations team is always at your disposal for anything um, that you may need.